the other ones, so it's kind of my mind has to uh, make a jump. Um, also, the name is misleading. I mean, ordinary differential equation is uh, <laughs> seems ordinary, right? And uh, introduction to differential equation seems like more advanced. I mean, almost the same, right? Um, <clears throat> but um, let's see. What, what I mean, ordinary differential equations are sort of the name ordinary is to distinguish from partial differential equations. Okay, so. Um, in other words, in this course, we will not see any partial, well, we'll see partial derivatives, but we won't see partial differential equations. Um, and uh, but we'll, see a lot, we'll see a lot of first order, second order, you know, differential equations. And um, so you must have had a differential equation in the recent past. Um, and we'll also talk about sort of, um, you know, what comes next. I mean, some of you may have already done some systems of differential equations in, in your 340 course. Um, at least if you taught, if, if I taught it, but I only taught it once, so you probably didn't. Anybody has seen systems of differential equations in a differential equation class? Yeah, so that's kind of one one of the options. And the other option is series solutions. So how many of you have seen series solutions of differential equations? Um, so anyway, so um, I won't assume that you've seen systems. So but we'll talk about uh, systems quite a bit. Systems is just basically two or two or more differential equations coupled together. Um, so let's. Get started as long as I figure why there's no. I'm still on battery. Okay. So it should be okay now. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's say I give the syllabus. And um, since there are, you know, 447 and 547 students, um, I'll talk about sort of distinction. But um, um, let me just say a few words about this. Great. Okay, so, uh, and I'm sorry, it's really fine print. Looks like fine print, but um, so let's say my plan is to to assign homework sort of uh, every week, and um, have the lowest homework grade dropped, 
Uh, let's see, I think I have already the first assignment up. This is going to be due a week from, from today. And it's going to be over chapter one. So we're going to start chapter one. And um, let's see, I have two exams, so please note the dates here and the final. Um, kind of late, but anyway, it cannot be changed. So um, <clears throat> Monday, the 18th of May, I think is the last day of, of the final week. Um, so I'd like you to uh, mark this. You know, I don't I don't give makeup exams, so um, try not to get sick before um, that date those dates. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to be using uh, computers for certain aspects of this. Um, so I'm going to be using MATLAB, but I won't really expect it, uh, you have you know, prior experience because it's not about programming a lot. It's just sort of using the tool for uh, you know, uh, illustrating things that we learned. So. So everything that you need to know, uh, um, sort of about MATLAB, I'll, I'll give it. I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so students in the graduate students, I um, I will assign um, a list of, of projects that I like uh, you to pick from, and I have a report at the end of the semester, and I'm hoping to also have some sort of presentations so, um, of course off camera uh, uh, you won't be on camera so um, but have uh, maybe the last couple of meetings for presentations um, from this project so so I'll give you the de details um, a little bit later on uh, the plan is from this book to use maybe to cover the first 10 chapters And uh, possibly chapter 14 on, on um, or 15 on, yeah, 14 on cha chaotic behavior, and maybe chapter 15 on discrete dynamical systems. Um, and right now, I'm, I mean, just to give you a rough ideas, um, I'm going to center the projects for the graduate students around chapters 11, 12, and 13. So. These are some applications uh, in biology, in, in electrical engineering, and in mechanics. So some of the things that we're going to learn have, um, you know, basically have their origins in either mechanics or um, biology or engineering. Um, <clears throat> so you know, part of the project will be to kind of um, read, you know. You, Pick one of the three chap you know topics depending on your kind of interests, um, and um, and then once you've picked it, you know just get familiar with that chapter, and I'll uh, I'll assign a certain task. Okay, but certainly this is not restricted to those three topics. If you have you know whatever major or whatever discipline you're in. Um, if you have other interests, you know, like we can always find applications of OD in pretty much every field. Um, okay, so what is OD? What is ordinary differential equation? It's basically study of a system that evolves usually as, with time, right? So you kind of analyze a system that um, has a certain configuration initially and then obeys certain laws, right, and then just evolves with time, and you want to know what the evolution of it is, right? Most of the time is a deterministic, that is, if you know the, what, how the system looks now, and you know the, the laws that govern that system, you'll know how it will look tomorrow, right? Uh, the chaotic behavior can, you know, is also a possibility in certain systems, like in the weather system, where you know how it looks now, but you know it's very unclear how it's going to look tomorrow, right? So there's 
also um, that's that kind of aspect so hopefully it's going to get there but in this course what we focus on is on finite number of parameters in the system that we observe okay so for instance if it's just one parameter like take um, temperature okay then we follow the temperature evolution with time that should obey a differential equation of just one first you know just one differential equation right you can write that down with uh, basically rate of change of temperature you know I don't know Newton's law of cooling for instance if you've seen it before says what the rate of change of temperature is sort of proportional or inverse proportional to the temperature uh, difference between the object and the ambient right so if it's if you put a hot hot object in in this room right it's going to cool right at what rate uh, the rate is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object at the, each instant of time and the room temperature assuming the room temperature stays the same okay that means we only care about one parameter right I'm still on battery I don't know what's going on but um, sorry for this okay so let me uh, let me write down what I just said here so so um, ODEs can happen um, so basically is study the time evolution of a physical system I mean it could be biological whatever um, with finite finitely many variables that is it could be uh, you know as an example it could be Newton's law of cooling which says what <clears throat> if I have theta to be temperature of an object so object could be I don't know I don't know complicated but we only say there you know that object at a, at a time T has one temperature right but we don't look at the, how the temperature is distributed in that object right just think of the whole object has one temperature and that's one number right um, then we have a differential equation describing the um, T is the room ambient temperature okay so that's I mean that's also what you've seen in previous courses so it's actually linear um, right linear and theta so theta is the unknown <clears throat> the derivative of theta is related to the current state by this you know linear function so um, hopefully I mean, we're gonna try to we're gonna solve this also but hopefully you've seen this before how to solve this uh, linear equations first order okay? um, what's another example Nonlinear pendulum um, I'm going to use that again, but 
this time theta represents angle, right? An angle, um, angle between the pendulum and vertical line. And it's a function at time t. Okay, this system has one variable, right? In other words, by knowing that one, the value of that one variable at all times describes the system. Okay. Agree. Um, but the law. So if this has a mass attached. The pendulum has a mass, and it's in the. Uh, it's in the. Uh, you know, it, uh, gravity is acting on that. Um, then there is. What is the uh, what is the equation? Mass times second derivative. equals what? GL is a GL sine of theta MG, sorry. Oh uh, no, no, I'm sorry, it's M. That's right. So let's see, what is this? This is Newton's law of motion. which says mass times acceleration is force, right? And this is, uh, why is the sign that shows up here? Because well, this is some physics here. There's, there's gravitation, right? Mg. So I guess there's an M also there. I didn't put And then there is projection of that force onto the direction of the pendulum. Okay? So that this acceleration is sort of the angular acceleration. So it's so it should actually be this force here. Okay? Anyway, the details of this, I mean, just just look at this equation. What do you see? You see a differential equation that has its second order, right? And it has nonlinear. It's a nonlinear equation. Okay. What what does this make it nonlinear? Can somebody tell me? Because the derivative is not constant, right? That's, um, that's that's one way to say it, right? I mean, to be linear, you'd have to have just theta, not sine theta, basically. Um, Another way that makes this another thing that makes this nonlinear is if you take two theta one and theta two two solutions of this, right, and you add them up, you don't get the same as sine of theta one plus theta two, right? So sine of theta one plus theta two is not the same as sine of theta one plus sine of theta two. So, if you remember, I mean, in OD, in the introduction to OD class, you've had, uh, most of the times you had linear equations, right? And what was the advantage of having linear equations? You could take two solutions, add them together, and get another solution, right? Well, that's not going to happen when you, when you don't, when you, when there are terms in your equations that don't behave like that. If I have two solutions, theta 1 and theta 2, and I add them, pure add them together, I'm not going to get a solution. Okay? So this superposition principle doesn't, doesn't hold. Okay? So, so this is um, contrast 
with linear second, say second order equations. What what was linear second order looking like? Um, let's stay with let's stay with theta. Theta double prime plus I don't know. Let's call it p of t theta prime plus q of t theta equals g of t. Right. This is linear because if I write, if I have a, one solution, well, let, let's do the homogeneous. Let's say there's this is equal to zero. So sometimes we use this. Say the, the put everything in one side that has theta, and say this is a sort of an operation operator on on theta. Then, if I have one solution and another solution, and I add them up, then I also get a solution. Right? So if theta one and theta two of t are two solutions. then actually not only some but linear combinations is also solution and this much you should remember from and in, in, in the first course on ODE you had a lot of situations where you had to solve this let's say with constant coefficients but also there are some with non-constant coefficients. But let's say there's constant coefficients, right? Then what was the task? It was to find two solutions that are not, you know, uh, multiple of each other, right? Because we call them fundamental set of solutions or linearly independent solutions. Then writing the linear combination gave you not only solutions but all solutions. Well, that property was fundamentally tied to the linearity, the fact that this, all the terms here are linear. Okay? So this, something like this is not going to happen for nonlinear. And even this pendulum, this very simple pendulum, is an example of that. Okay? Now, physicists, uh, in physics, what you do is you say if theta is very small, so if the oscillations are just around the equilibrium, right? but very small, then sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. Right? Sine function is has slope 1. So back to this. Let's just let's just pretend that, you know all of those constants are such that this this is our equation, right? This is nonlinear, right? So you have not learned any method to solve that. In fact, there is no explicit solution to this. Okay? But for small theta, thetas, sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. Okay? And that's simply because that's the graph sine, right? And that's the graph of theta. I mean, it's a linear appro linear approximation. So you could say, you know, you could replace. There was also minus. So so now I'm I'm getting that whole picture here. There is also minus. Okay. You can approximate, so you can change the system, what we'll later learn as being, we're going to linearize the system um, with, and, and make it a linear differential equation, which you can solve, okay? Or this, 
and this can be solved explicitly. Well, guess what? Are the solutions of this equation going to be solutions to the original equation? No. Right? You, it's two different equations, right? But the solutions of this equation that are very small in amplitude, like, uh, you know, what are these? These are sines and cosines, right? With some constants in front. So if those constants are very small, then you can find solutions of that that are approximately, or this approximately those solutions, right? So there's going to be all kinds of techniques. I'm just, I'm just kind of anticipating a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing, but um, that we're going to relate systems that come from physical uh, problems to, you know, what kind of methods can we use to solve those systems? Okay. Now. Um, So, in this, these are two examples of a system, a systems that only have one sort of essential variable, right? There could be systems where there are three essential variables that are important. Okay. Um, lots of examples. I mean, but just think of motion in space. Okay. When you have motion in space, your location is determined if you know the three coordinates, right? And those three coordinates are sort of independent uh, variables, right? So just basically describing the motion means describing those three variables. So what you're going to have is you're going to have Motion in 3D is going to be what? Mass times acceleration equals a force, right? Let's say a force is, you know the force, you want to find the, the, the trajectory, right? The motion. So this is going to be uh, what is the derivative, second derivative with respect to time of the position, right? So x is x of t, is x1 of t, x2 of t, x3 of t. Is position at time t. So what we're going to be looking here is have second derivative of each uh, variable of each coordinate given as uh, functions of x1, x2, x3. Now, depends what f looks like, right? Um, If f, if f looks like um, uh, gravity, then does anybody, everybody knows what, um, let's say f is minus g x over x cubed. What is this? Well, this is just saying I have, think about the sun as being in the origin, right? And I have an object. What's the force acting on this object, which is at location x? Well, it's opposite to x, right? And what magnitude? Newton. Hmm? The magnitude. So the magnitude is in, in the gravitational force as two objects attract each other with a force inverse proportional to the square of the distance. So so this thing is 
the distance is the absolute value of x, right? The norm, right? The length of x. I'm, I'm talking about the uh, Calc 3 terminology, right? So I have a vector x, I have the length of x, right? And I'm, I'm writing this vector as being parallel to x and having magnitude equal to constant over length squared, right? So this is and if you remember from Calc 3, how do you do that? You take the vector, the unit vector in that direction, x over length of x, that gives you unit length vector. And this just this is the magnitude, right? And you put the minus because it's opposed to x. Okay? Anyway, so that's if you if you want to put this force and ask yourself, you know, what's the motion according to this force? Then you see what what do you have to put in the, in the for the first component? It's the first component of this, right? What's the first component of this? This is a scalar, so it's just x one, right? So it's minus g x one over. And now, what's the length of The length of the vector x is the square root of the x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square. Everything of that is to the power cubed, right? So that's the, that's the first equation. Whether you like it or not. What's the second one? It's going to be x2 over the same, and this is going to be x3 over the same, right? Okay? Are this linear? I think that was a good uh, uh, criterion. If you differentiate with respect to x1, are you going to get rid of x1? No. It's, that's a quotient rule that's 3 halves power. Oh, I mean, it's just terrible, right? It's very nonlinear. It's very nonlinear with respect to all three variables, right? Another, another criterion is, you know, put x1 equals 1 and x1 equals 2. And add the two expressions, do you get the same as being x1 equals 3? That's far from being true, right? To be linear, it has to be x1 with a coefficient in front, plus x2 with a coefficient in front, plus x3 with a coefficient in front. No fraction, no square root, no, no, no value, nothing, right? Okay, so this is nonlinear, second order, three equations. So this is the kind of system we're going to be uh, looking at, okay? Now, you really get, can get overwhelmed if you single out a system and say, okay, tell me everything about this system, okay? So, uh, because every single system like this, or every single ODE, system of ODEs, has some uh, peculiarities, right? It has certain things. So what we're going to try to learn is, is, you know, what are the kind of generic things that we do with any system that's thrown at us? What do we study? You know, how do we get it? Right? And then, you know, if you really want to get into the depth of this, for instance, this is that application of mechanics, which says celestial mechanics. How do you study, you know, motion of planets that are, you know, uh, attracted by, by, by say, sun? You really have to deal with that system and conclude, you know, orbits are elliptical, they're in the plane, right? So you should, a planet, it, it won't do like crazy things, it will just stay in the plane, right? Um, and so forth, right? And it's all encoded in that system, okay? But it's, it's very powerful. Now, um, let me just say one other thing is that 
oftentimes, so these are systems of ODEs. Okay? It's just how many um, parameters, how many variables characterizes uh, characterize the system under study. Okay? And um, it's not my favorite um, example, but if you have a nuclear reactor, okay, and you're trying to say, you know, you're watching it, right? Well, you probably can watch it by sampling temperature at 20 different points, okay? So that basically means you are looking at a system with 20 different variables, right? And you're trying to make sure, you know, it doesn't, you know, blow up or something. Um, but the system itself is, is not just 20, those 20 points, right? The system is infinite number of variables, right? So that's, that's where you jump to PDs, partial differential equation models, okay? So we're staying at this level of uh, modeling, you know, deciding on, on what, how many finitely many are essential. Um, oftentimes, Uh, we prefer um, first order ODEs versus um, well system of ODEs. And what do I mean by that? So for instance if I have I'm already um, if if I start with a you know my physical law you know comes from Newton's law of motion means acceleration it means second order right so even if it's second order and it's just one equation then you can always convert it to to a system of two equations. Okay? How do we do that? Well, that's done by introducing sort of a new variable and another variable which accounts for the derivative of the original variable. Because if that's the case, then you can also write, so that's omega. Omega is from angular velocity, right? So if, if this is an angle, for, uh, theta, as a function of time, this is a function of time, then the derivative is, is called angular velocity. But what's the derivative of, of this new variable? Well, it would be the second derivative of of um, omega, um, the second derivative of theta, so it's given by that original equation, right? So now take a look. I have two variables, first order, right? Differential equations, system of first order differential equations, and the right side is again coupled, it's depending on both, right? Still nonlinear, right? As long as one, if, if there is one right hand side that is nonlinear, everything is nonlinear. Okay, but I, I've converted to a system of two first order equations. Okay? So, if you're mechanical engineering, then you would call the system as having how many degrees of freedom? Two, right? So there's, there's, I mean, even though there is only one, you know, 
variable you see, right? I mean, you say theta equals 45 degrees. That's it, right? That describes the system. But it doesn't describe the motion of the system. So to describe the motion of the system, you also need the velocity of that when, when theta is 45. And you need also the, at what speed is that, you know, when it's theta 45. So in, in essence, there are two, two degrees of freedom, right? Um, so the best way to think of these degrees of freedom is how many variables do I need to write the system as a first order? Take, take this motion in a gravitational field. How many degrees of freedom does this have? Six, right? Because each second order equation you know, corresponds to two first order equations, right? For the position and velocity in that component, basically. And so, six degrees of freedom, right? And that's just one object attracted by, by the sun. So, what if you have uh, n planets? What, nine or eight? No, no there are eight planets, right? Um, it's going to be 48 degrees of freedom, right? It's going to be a system of 48 equations, first order. Correct? All right. So for this first lecture, I have some good news. We're going to focus on one degree of freedom. OK. So we're going to talk about uh, first order single equations. So make this distinction. This is first order single equation versus that is what? Is a first order system of equations, right? It's a first order system of two equations, right? All right, so in this, uh, we're going to keep T as being the independent variable as, as with all. I mean, pretty much all the time this is going to be. But x is going to be the only dependent variable. So there's going to be only one you know, unknown function and the derivative is going to be, well let's, let me write it uh, in a sort of a dx dt is a function of t and x. Okay, This is first order, um, first order Ordinary differential equation, right? Okay, so and that sounds like my previous class. Uh, what are the examples? I mean, the example is simple examples are let's say I have x, x prime, so the derivative, I'm going to switch back and forth, right, between x prime and dx dt, equals ax. I don't know, maybe let's put it like this, dx dt. Right, a is a constant. Let's see, how do we solve this? Two different methods, right? One is separation of variables. And what's the other method? Okay, what's the solution? Hmm? Constant exponential of AT, right? Uh, e to the at, and if a is positive, this is increasing exponential growth. If a is negative, is the exponential decreasing? 
or dk. A could be zero, but A equals zero is really means dx dt is zero, so x is constant, right? How do we get from here to there? One is separation of variables, and the other is integrating factor, right? Integrating factor applies for linear equations. This is linear, nice and linear, right? So which one do you want to do? That's the separation, right? Separation makes you separate the variables, assuming you can integrate, right? What's natural? <coughs> excuse me. What's the integral of one over x? Is natural log of absolute value of x plus constant, and of course the integral of a is a t, and you can always throw all the constants on one side and rename them, so that's going to be plus c. Let's see, why is this important, the absolute value of x important? Because <clears throat> we didn't really say anything about whether x is positive or negative. So if x is negative, that's also valid. You just have to put the absolute value before, right? So you can take the natural log. So what's the next step is to exponentiate, right? Or using the you know exponent of sum is the product of the exponents. And to be very precise, I should just say e to the c. But since c is arbitrary, well, let's see to the at. Do you agree with that? So I don't have. That. So since c is arbitrary, e to the c is arbitrary, right? But here is positive. So the moment I rename it, I also take it take into account that this has to be the absolute value. So if I want just x, I should put plus or minus, right? So this in this c is could be positive or negative. Right? So that's that's what makes this whole thing work. Um, and how do we get to our solution again? We have to say what the initial, what the constant is, depending on what initial condition we have. So if if we know, so if we uh, are given x of zero equals x zero as the initial condition, then we substitute in there and we get x naught equals c e to the zero equals c so c is x naught back into this we get um, the solution in this form right okay so let's I'll ask you to kind of look at the integrating factor if you want to <clears throat> Um, okay, so that's the first very simple example, and let's go to the next one, which says the following. So this is logistic equation. Which is a well. It's you can see almost the relation between the previous and this one. Um, so in this equation, the right hand side is quadratic rather than linear, right? So this is a nonlinear equation, right? No integrating factor um, method. A is a constant, but it can be separated, right? Now models of, I mean, this equation models a population growth 
but not exponentially. It doesn't grow exponentially, so um, just a times x. But it's a times x minus a times x squared, right? And that usually models some competition, so that is x times x. So if, if x is really large, x times x is much larger. So this minus term, negative term, is going to force x to de decrease. Okay, So that's kind of, um, so maybe I'll do it like this. I mean, so this usually is called the growth rate, the intrinsic growth rate. And N is the carrying capacity. And we'll see why um, these two numbers. I mean, the, the intrinsic growth rate means, you know, in absence of any competition, this is how the rate at which this would grow. Okay? But with competition, there's going to be a ceiling of how much this population growth. That is, Above, this, above that ceiling, the population is going to actually decrease in number. So again, trying to solve this given some initial conditions or, or an initial condition, you only need one initial condition for first order equation. How do we solve this? If it's nonlinear equation, but it's first order, then you've done this. What how do you you don't have method of integrating factor, but what do you have? It's still, separ it's still separable, so you can separate it. <clears throat> and you will not really like the n there. You would like to maybe multiply by n and divide um, common factor in the parentheses. So and now you integrate. How do you integrate this thing? Well, the right side is easy, a t plus c, but the left side is needs some partial fractions. So how do you do it? I always lobby for you know, if you, if you don't have to do the long partial fraction, if you just see the decomposition, why not use it? Um, if I put a 1 and a 1 and a plus, is it going to make it? I always get complaints. I'm like, why? I mean, <clears throat> if you don't see it, then you put A and B, and you do it the long way, and you'll end up with A and B both 1. <laughs> okay? So, Sort of add into fractions in the reverse order. <laughs> that's, that's what the composition of partial fraction is. So is this right? So n minus x here plus x n. Okay. So what's the integral of, of one over x? I said natural log of x plus. What's the integral of one over n minus x? Shouldn't be natural log of n minus x. Hmm? Yes or no? There is a minus here, right? So there should be a minus. So that's good because now I have x over n minus x equals at plus c. So I can do the same kind of exponentiating. So it's going to be a constant after I have renamed that. Well, okay, e to the c. Now I can rename the constant to the C, 
which is positive, but now I can take it, get rid of the absolute value. Okay. And what what's next? I have to solve for x. So how do I solve for x? So x I mean one plus c to the a t equals n c e to the a t. So x is n c to the a t over one plus c to the e to the a t. Something like this, right? Anyway, the book uses n equals 1 as an example. But uh, let's see. Is this all solutions? Like what is the constant C now? Given by initial condition, right? So the initial condition should be when T is zero, C is X naught over N minus X naught. Right? So at T equals zero, x naught n minus x naught equals c e to the zero, right? So you plug that in and you get x of t is n x naught over n minus x naught c e to the a t over 1 plus x naught e to the a t okay. and just common denominator gives you n x naught e to the a t over n minus x naught plus x naught e to the a t So how can you draw any conclusions out of this? You know, that's one of the, well, very, not very rare, but uh, seldom cases when you can actually write the solution. Okay. The general solution, right? Or actually, in this case, is the solution to the initial value problem. So, so you give me x naught, and I'll give you the solution, right? x of t. So what's the best way to kind of understand the, the solution to a first order equation is what's called you know direction field and phase line. Okay so is, is as simple as saying let's plot x versus t okay and in this phase line we're going to we're going to plot the solutions that we get okay so which is not very uh Sort of revealing if you have the explicit solution, because you then you have to be able to plot this for all 
for, 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 for given x naught, plot that solution, right? So it's always better to start with the direction field. What is the direction field? Direction field is sort of saying that, coming back to the original, Uh, equation it says these things the right hand sides dictate basically the slope so let me let me plot and I'll tell you, tell you why but let me plot one solution and the one solution that say for I don't know x naught equals n over 2 if you if you put n over 2 in that in that equation Okay, or any value between zero and n. Then you're gonna get something like this, right? Which really is called the logistic curve. That's where the name comes from. Um, okay. What is this equation saying? It's saying that that this curve, at every point on the curve, has the slope of a tangent equal to the right hand side. Okay. So, in other words, it is sufficient to say what the slope is at each point in the plane. I mean, pl in, pl in the plane, in, in the xt plane. So, how do we do that? Well, what's the, I mean, by hand it's kind of tough, but Let me, okay, let me, uh, now I'm going to focus on n equals 1, so I'm, I'm going to assume n equals 1. Okay, so the right hand side is just a times x1 minus x, right? So this function is a parabola, right? So if I if I'm to plot y equals a x one minus x, you agree with that? So it is positive between zero and one. So as long as my point lies with x between 0 and 1, so this is x, 0 and 1, then the direction is going to be positive. Slope is going to be positive. But it's less positive as I get closer to 1, and it's most positive in the middle, but then it, again it gets less positive, right? And this just indicates the, what the slope of the curve that when it hits the x-axis would have to have, right? But now let's do it at another time here, at a later time. What do you think is going to... Well, this right-hand side doesn't depend on t. So it's going to have the same. Same slopes as this one, right? In fact, at any kind of location you do, it's going to be the same. You agree with that? So this is what we, what we call the direction field. We just say, so again, this is plotted at the same value of t, at some value of t, but the same one here. By the way, let's do the, what, what if uh, x were to be above 1? Then when x is above 1, this right-hand side is negative. This is going to be like this, and it's going to be more and more negative, right? So in essence, when you solve this equation, given an initial condition, you're saying, you know, what curve starts at this point and then follows the direction field, right? And you can see, well, by hand is hard, but you can see that kind of it has to go uh, less and less steep, right? Now it's not clear why it 
it always stays below this level one when, you know, why can't, why can't it jump at some point above one? Well, it cannot jump above one because above one everything is coming downhill, right? I mean, that's, there is something to talk about that. Uh, and also here is the same thing. It's kind of goes downhill, but it never goes below zero. Why? Because below zero, the directions, oh, sorry, are how? Oh, up or down? Does it make sense what I'm talking about? More and more down, right? So again, it cannot go dip below zero. This curve cannot dip below zero because you'd have to go back up, right? In fact, there are two. There are two solutions that are constant. Like the constant, the solution where x stays constant to m, for instance, right? or if n equals 1, then 1, corresponds to, well, should be in that formula, right? If x naught is n, what happens? n minus n is 0, the fraction is 1, so the thing is n, right? Constant in time. And also, if x 0 is 0, Put zero there, and you get x equals zero, right? So this x equals zero is also a solution. These are called equilibrium or steady states, and it's no coincidence that they correspond to what places where the right hand side is zero. Okay. So steady states. or equilibrium are x zero star where the right hand side vanishes. So in our case Again, what, if right hand side vanishes, it means dx dt is zero, right? In our case, x1 minus x, let's say over n equals zero, it means x is zero, or y minus x over n is zero, so x is n. So I have these two steady states, okay? So making that picture is kind of the uh, way to, s to understand the solution much better than looking always for an explicit solution. Okay? Now, of course, if there is an explicit solution, it's nice to kind of be able to match the two. But it's not always going to, you're not, first of all, you're not going to always going to be able to find explicit solutions. Um, and then even if you do, you know, you still need to figure out, figure out this picture for it sort of, sort of um, independently of the, of the uh, uh, exact solutions. Um, let me just say, what, what is the behavior of solutions if x is above this carrying capacity? It looks like it go, goes down, right? So the question is, you know, can you really see it from here? Well, yes, if you, you know, x0 bigger than n, then this thing is negative, then you can figure out the limit as the t goes to infinity. It's a good exercise. Uh, but it goes down and approaches that carrying capacity. And also, if you're below zero, then it just dips, goes exponentially down, right? So there are two more things that one can read from this picture is what's the quality of this, um, of this equilibrium, of this steady state. So if, 
If the population starts at the carrying capacity, exactly at the carrying capacity, then it stays at the carrying capacity, right? But so does it if it starts at zero, then it stays at zero. So what's the difference between this and that? If the population here starts near the carrying capacity, what happens with the solution? So I didn't plot a lot of them, but you can imagine what happens if it goes like this, right? So if you start near the carrying near this value, then it actually approaches this value, right? So we say this equilibrium is stable, or that the equilibrium is a sink, okay? Because the, the, all the values around this value approach, you know, uh, at, at th that value. And this one is the opposite, right? If you start at zero, then it stays at zero, but if you start very close to zero, then you're gonna go away from zero. So that's an unstable. <coughs> X equals N is a stable <coughs> steady state. Uh, or a sink because again if you start not n but close to n then you're gonna approach n because if x zero is is close to n then x of t approaches n as t goes to infinity x equals zero is an unstable steady state or a source because the picture is the opposite. Of course t is always you know going to the right. T increasing is going to the right. So going no, this was, I'm sorry, t, the t-axis is not this, this was, okay, the t-axis is down here, right? But here is indeed, you start close to the origin and you go away, okay? And of course, we're interested in, as time increases, of course, if you were to go in time to negative infinity, it would be the opposite. But we always think of the physical time. Okay? And um, let me just say one thing that you can actually read this. One can label this uh, these equilibria from um, the graph of the right hand side with respect to x. So let's look at just quickly look at this. If I have a, if I have a um, this quadratic one, right? So that's the logistic. When the right hand side is quadratic, it's logistic. Um, what can you read? Well, we usually write it like this. We say that. Oh, I'm sorry. When the right hand side is positive, x is increasing. Right hand side positive, x is increasing, right? It doesn't really say how much or where, but it's just going away from zero. Here is going towards the other equilibrium. So this is this is zero and this is n. What if you're above? Well the the right hand side is negative, so you're decreasing. What if x is negative? Then it's again decreasing. So you can see what this is a sink and this is a source. Sink is when the arrow points towards, right? So it means when the curve goes from positive to negative, the right hand side. And this is a source, okay? So in the homework, and again, I, if you have to talk about some. Um, 
many things, but just the first problem, the homework, um, has that kind of analysis where you plot the right-hand side and you see where it's positive, where it's negative, where it's zero, and where it's negative. Okay. And let's see. Monday we're going to talk about um, some of the bifurcation analysis when um, the system may depend on some parameters that change. And also we'll talk about cases when the right hand side is depends on time. Like this, this didn't depend on time, right? So the kind of the issues that appear in that uh, situation as well. Any questions?